Our news is brought to you by Alive. Believe in best. Tonight on Our News, double denial. Health officials reject the holiday carnival's second application. Local courts seriously understaffed. And a teen awarded a five-figure settlement following a run-in with police. Welcome to our news and thanks for joining us. I'm Christina Dragovich. Topping news tonight, the government has once again rejected the application of the holiday carnival to operate, citing concerns over the spread of the new Omicron COVID-19 variant. Carnival operators are now seeking legal advice on the way forward. Meanwhile, individuals who expected to begin work at the carnival this evening were outside the property seeking answers. Kyle Joaquin has the story. In the view of the medical experts, allowing the carnival to proceed posed a significant risk to the public. They therefore recommended that it should not be allowed to proceed. It was a hard no from health officials yet again for the holiday carnival, even after repeated meetings and steps taken to address health concerns. As you may recall, this is the second time the holiday carnival submitted its application to the Ministry of Health. Since that first time, they have since put up several of these signs encouraging people to stand six, at least six feet apart. Despite all these efforts, they were once again denied. The carnival's attorney, Beyond Ferguson, told our news team yesterday that they were prepared to move ahead with operating, even if the application was denied. Well, during an emergency press conference this afternoon, the definitive no from the prime minister's office, citing the Omicron variant and preparation for the reopening of schools. The panel considered their submission closely, uh, but decided that the transmission risk associated with the carnival remained too high and the protocols presented would not sufficiently mitigate against the spread of COVID, especially given the new variant. Still, there are many unanswered questions, like who gave approvals in what ministries, who is responsible for the money already spent, and even this question we tried to ask. Thank you, colleagues, for coming. Is government prepared for a potential lawsuit? Thank you, Kyle. We'll address that tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. After the news broke, people who expected to begin their first day of work at 5 p.m., showed up seeking answers. I don't understand why the closing can say open up schools January. What's the difference between a carnival and school? The children still could be together, you understand me? And they bring everything here, make everything stand out, and they just drop it straight down on us. This father of two says he's now in a state of depression as the money was needed this holiday season. His whole belief depended on me because I have two children to feed and and really, really, um, in a state of depression right now with this because it's, it's not making no sense. Why should I let something come here then stop it? That doesn't make no sense. While this security guard and another worker chose not to be on camera, they say this debacle is far beyond disappointing. We're saying, okay, the carnival is here, it's already set up. We're good to go, we're ready to go, we have work. Now it comes now that we don't have no work no more, come on. We need answers for the government to say, what, why, why is this happening? But you're standing outside the gate, hopefully somebody will come and talk to you. Because they, they told us to come back today at 5 o'clock. I, I know a lot of them don't have any uh, jobs, so I guess they were, they're really counting on, you know, counting the banking on employment here. The company that operates the carnival, McCafferty's Enterprises Bahamas Limited, was locked in a meeting with its attorney while we were there and said they'd wait to comment on their next move. Although one manager told us earlier the company will pack up and leave. Outside, management said lawyers will speak from here. Is the carnival still going to leave? You're going to pack up and leave? What's, what's going to happen now? You plan on operating? No comment. All right. All right. I understand he's meeting with lawyers right now. Yes. His lawyer is the one who makes the comments, I think. Okay. For our news, I'm Kyle Joaquin. Well, the judiciary is facing serious understaffing issues, according to Chief Justice Sir Brian Moree QC. He sat down for an exclusive interview with Jasmine Brown ahead of the opening of the legal year. I sat down with the Chief Justice this morning and he revealed just how bad those staffing issues are. We have serious staffing issues. Um, HR issues which need to be addressed. The Chief Justice was candid in his comments as he revealed there are staff shortages in several areas of the judiciary. He says approximately 250 people currently employed in the court system are not enough to fill the voids. In the perfect world, how many people would be employed um, in this system? Let me answer that as best I can, bearing in mind my numbers are approximate. 
Um, don't hold me to precise numbers. Um, but uh, at the moment, uh, I think we, we have somewhere around 240, 260 people, somewhere in that range. But we are, we are substantially understaffed um, in many areas. We're, we're understaffed in terms of clerks, secretaries, accounting department, bailiffs. Um, we're understaffed in terms of our uh, domestic staff, particularly with the pandemic. So Brian says in order to fill the staffing deficit, they would need to hire up to 100 new employees. In an ideal world, um, we probably need at least 80 to 100 new members of staff. Now, people would say, oh, that's ridiculous. Well, I'm sorry, it happens to be a fact. I mean, we, we have had studies conducted um, on, our, on our human resources and what the needs are to run an efficient um, court system. The number is so high because we are so far behind. Um, the immediate need is to bring in these 50, 60 new hires, new employees, um, in order to allow us um, j just basically to tread water. The CJ says the staffing shortage comes at a time when they are seeking to implement a number of changes to improve efficiency, including setting up technological upgrades to the courts. Now, as it relates to what's planned for current staff, Sir Brian says Charlotte House will accommodate the Bahamas Judicial Education Institute for staff training. Reporting for our news, I'm Jasmine Brown. In news from the courts, a teen was awarded $26,000 in damages and $20,000 in legal costs after the Office of the Attorney General admitted that two officers were wrong for pushing him over a railing, assaulting him, then arresting him. Jared Higgs has the details. It's a video that went viral more than two years ago. The scene is BISS 2019. Police Constable 4016 Cumberbatch shown in uniform and Police Constable Barry Brown wearing plain clothes order a 17-year-old to climb back over a barricade. As the teen complies and is climbing over, Cumberbatch pushes the teen, nearly causing him to fall. The two officers then assault the student further by grabbing hold of him. Then they put him in handcuffs. Of course I was incensed because why would you push a juvenile in those circumstances. The video got the attention of defense attorney Christina Galanos, who happened upon it while scrolling Facebook. I put on my Facebook page, you know, if anyone knows them, I'm prepared to take on the case pro bono. They contacted me, I took the case on pro bono. The matter proceeded to court, and despite clear video evidence, a trial ensued. Before the court entered its judgment, the defendants, or I should say the Office of the Attorney General on behalf of the defendants, um, admitted liability and we agreed to settle out at a particular sum. That sum, $26,000 in damages and a further $20,000 in legal costs was awarded for Galanos. She says that figure is higher because the AG's office took the matter to trial instead of settling right away. I made two applications for summary judgment and the office of the attorney general fought it, um, which was foolish because at this point, they would have had less money for me. Galano says her client suffered serious embarrassment as a result of the encounter, which took place in front of dozens of his peers and went viral on social media. The former Gentlemen's Club member was left beyond discouraged. Galano's hopes that young and seasoned police officers see this story and think twice about how they interact with citizens. And with the taxpayers on the hook for the $46,000 bill, she says she believes things would change even more if officers face financial repercussions for their actions. I long for the day in this country where we are taking at least some of it out of the police officer's salary. Reporting for our news, I'm Jared Higgs. Clear conditions tonight. Greg Thompson has the first look at weather. Thanks, Christine, and welcome everybody for your first look at weather. Brought to you tonight by Ports International, trusted medical supplies for a better quality of life. Another warm and breezy evening outside our studios right now. Temperatures in the mid-70s once again on the mostly clear skies. Those winds are still howling out there easily at 12 miles per hour, and you'll feel slight temperature at 77 degrees. Quiet across our area in terms of showers. We do still have a few small, fast-moving showers coming out of the Atlantic. That upper-level trough moved out to the east of the Bahamas, but that high pressure will continue to dominate our weather over the next 24 to 36 hours with very strong winds and some occasional passing showers. That's your first look at weather. Your extended forecast is still to come. 
Still to come, calls for clarity ahead of a VAT reduction. This as the DPM dismisses his predecessor's call to hold off on the VAT decrease. Find out more after this. Welcome to our news and thanks for joining us. Topping news tonight. COVID-19 remains a serious threat. Coronavirus COVID-19 has disrupted our economy, tourism industry, educational system, and put our healthcare facilities and professionals on high alert. Are you prepared? Do you have all the facts? Stay tuned to this network for the very latest news and information on this global pandemic. With a reduction in value-added tax set for 2022, some members of the business community say they need clarity on the proposed changes. It's more centered around getting clarification on whether or not the VAT change will in fact take place on January 1 and ensuring that all of the, the private sector businesses are ready for this change. Chairman of the Bahamas Chamber of Commerce and Employers Confederation, Crystal Rutherford Ferguson, says there's still some uncertainty surrounding the change in VAT. And while it may seem like a small change, businesses will need to act swiftly if the implementation begins January 1st, 2022. It's the sticker label changes, it's the POS, it's the manpower and the hours that a business would have to dedicate to making these changes. So we need to make sure that there is clarity around all of the details regarding this particular point. She says it's part of a wider conversation that needs to be had with government in regard to taxation in the country. Those taxes will not only impact businesses' bottom line, but also the ease of doing business in the country. There is still an issue regarding tax reform. So currently under, under the, the current tax system, we have the business license fee. But we need to look at a way to address that so that it can be more equitable. So those conversations have started with government, but we hope to continue the conversations. Well, Deputy Prime Minister Chester Cooper says there will be no delay in the government's planned decrease of value-added tax to 10 percent. He was asked to respond to former Finance Minister Peter Turnquist, who suggested the government hold off on reducing the VAT rate for now, given the country's financial situation and uncertainty surrounding the pandemic. Cooper says Turnquist should enjoy retirement. Peter Turnquist is entitled to his opinion. Uh, he had an opportunity to be the Minister of Finance. Now I wish he would just enjoy his retirement. Uh, the reality is that we have studied the models. Uh, we are satisfied that we are able to exceed our revenue targets. The VAT reduction was a key promise of the Progressive Liberal Party on the campaign trail. The VAT amendment bill has already passed through the House of Assembly and the Senate with the change set to take effect January 1st. We are making significant inroads in terms of growing our economy uh, and therefore we're not minded to follow the, the pundits and the critics. Uh, this is serious work. We will continue to do so every day. We will follow the science in terms of managing our economy as we've done with managing COVID. As the pandemic pain lingers, two Bahamian professionals living in Florida share their experiences of battling COVID in another country. Sasha Lightborn has that. Being in the Bahamas and battling the effects of the pandemic has been a struggle, but recently relocating to the United States just before the pandemic hit has made the experience 10 times as difficult. We caught up with Laron Calmer, Bahamian owner and proprietor of Seafood Shack in Miami Beach, who says it has been a challenge. Uh, all the stipulations that we've been facing have been totally different from what I expected, and it's not like NASA. I want everyone to understand that all my little young Bahamian entrepreneurs seem like I go to America, it's gonna be easier. That is not the case. It is going that. to be times 10. If you thought people was a problem for you in the Bahamas, it's times 100. If you thought that was a problem in the Bahamas, it's times 10 over here. If you thought price point, inventory, uh, uh, fresh food is a problem in the bar. If you're complaining about that, stay. 
Calmer moved to the United States just before opening his first stateside location. He also runs the Robinson Road location here in Nassau. Makeup artist Sasha LaPesh shares similar sentiments. She says she had a plan, but that plan expired, rather became null and void once COVID emerged in March 2020. We don't tell the whole truth about what it is coming to America, and I think a lot of times we're jaded because we come here to visit, and visiting here is completely different from living here. Um, it took some adjustments. Um, it was very humbling. Um, I left Nassau with a thriving business, and I pretty much had to start from scratch over here. And while both Calmer and LaPesh say things have been tough, they both are committed to their businesses and will continue to fight to succeed. For Our News, I'm Sasha Lightborn. When Our News returns, Santa drops in at the Crisis Center and Thursday Night Football kicks off Week 15. The details when Our News returns. Welcome to our news and thanks for joining us. Topping news tonight. COVID-19 remains a serious threat. Coronavirus COVID-19 has disrupted our economy, tourism industry, educational system, and put our healthcare facilities and professionals on high alert. Are you prepared? Do you have all the facts? Stay tuned to this network for the very latest news and information on this global pandemic. This is our news. Welcome back. Santa Claus and his elves were on foot this year for drive through Christmas at the Bahamas Crisis Center. Director Sandra Dean Patterson says the traditional Christmas party plans had to be pushed aside this year. Now when we would have it in the church hall, we would have activities, games, um, raffles, uh, music, singing Christmas carols. But because of COVID, we just had to do it through it with a drive through. When you see their eyes light up, when you see the smiles on their faces, it's a fantastic feeling. And that's what I get out of it is just being a Rotarian to do what I can, help where I can, and provide whatever help we can throughout the community. The Rotary Club, Liferkey International School and Tamberley School helped to make the spirit merry for about 150 children and their families. We have families that look forward to this. For many like this, you know, when I talked about the photo, everybody gets a photo of the family. For many families, this is the only photo they have of their family and they look forward to taking it and going home with it. Buddy Heald helping the Kings to score a win. Marcellus Hall has that and more tonight in sports. All right, thanks a lot. Welcome to our sports, everybody. I'm Marcellus Hall. It's been a long time coming for Buddy Heal and the Sacramento Kings. Uh, he's having a rough up and down type of season. Going into last night's game, he kind of gone ice cold from outside, which, as you know, is how he makes his living. Last night, trying to get back on track, hoping to get his team to a win. Let's see how they did. Buddy Heal, Sacramento Kings at home, taking on the Washington Wizards, hoping to pick up a win here on this one. And uh, guess what? Uh, they wonder of wonders, they get it done. 119 to 105 ends up being the final score. Sacramento improves to 12 and 17, 6 and 8 at home. Looking at uh, Buddy's stats coming off the bench, as has been what he's been doing lately 29 minutes played, 4 of 10 from the field, including 4 of 7 from three point range. He finishes up with 15 points to go along with a rebound and also an assist in the game. What do you know? He also had a steal. So it kind of fills out the stat sheets, but mostly from the three-point area. Good to see him getting back on track. More importantly, Sacramento gets a win. On to the NFL, where Thursday night football comes your way tonight. Interesting game here and a good one. Looking forward to seeing how this one turns out. As uh, on the agenda for you tonight will be a great matchup between the Kansas City Chiefs and the Los Angeles Chargers, uh, two up-and-coming quarterbacks, obviously. We'll see how this one turns out. Justin Herbert has been playing well for this, uh, for this Chargers team, looking to see if they can pull off a big win here against the Kansas City Chiefs, who's been playing outstanding, phenomenal football. Patrick Mahomes seems to have found his stride, and we'll see again how it all turns out in the, at the end of this one as another week of NFL action gets under week, week 15 already. And that's your look at sports here on this Thursday. We'll give you full details uh, of the Thursday night football game. We'll give you how that happens and everything else. Meanwhile, I'm Marcellus Hall. Back to you. Thanks, Marcellus. Still ahead, adventure in the arts takes on a holiday twist. Stay with us.
Welcome to our news and thanks for joining us. Topping news tonight. COVID-19 remains a serious threat. Coronavirus COVID-19 has disrupted our economy, tourism industry, educational system, and put our healthcare facilities and professionals on high alert. Are you prepared? Do you have all the facts? Stay tuned to this network for the very latest news and information on this global pandemic. Welcome back to our news. A mixture of sunshine and rain this weekend. Greg is back in the Weather Center. Thanks again, Christina. Welcome back, everybody, for your second look at our weather tonight. High pressure remains in charge of our weather. That's going to continue to dominate the weather scene for the next couple of days as that high pressure system continues to produce some very strong winds out there, making beaching and boating a challenge for the next day or two before things start to ease up by the weekend. That high will continue to pump in some Atlantic moisture, so we could see some occasional passing showers. Those will be quick in passing, so uh, not much in terms of any significant rainfall expected. But that high eventually sliding out to the east, that's going to be paving the way for a frontal boundary that should get near sometime by Monday, Tuesday. And then behind that, we expect another strong, windy week for the upcoming Christmas week. Boating forecast for all areas tonight through tomorrow. Small craft advisory remains in effect. Your winds will continue out of the northeast suites at 15 to 25 knots. Becoming more easterly tomorrow. Sea is very rough, 5 to 8 feet. They will be higher in gusts. Tide is presently high. Will be low at 4 minutes past midnight. Here's a look now at your national forecast. A look now at your extended forecast through Thursday. That's a look at our weather. Make it a safe evening, everybody. Back to you, Christina. Thanks, Greg. A local performing artist and pianist is adding a holiday twist to his edutainment series that has attracted hundreds of fans over the last four years. Creator of Adventures in the Arts, Dion Cunningham, says he's excited about the Christmas edition. Some people have compared it to a Broadway-style show. Others have, uh, have called it a, a, an arts collage of sorts. But the best way I can describe it to you, Jasmine, is to simply say you got to come to experience it yourself. Cunningham says they've poured hundreds of hours into the project, which will feature performances as well as visual and digital art presentations on December 17th and 18th at Christ Community Church on Bellet Road. We have uh, tickets available at Island House and at the venue. Um, you can reserve them at 448-0985. And we encourage you to get them quickly because we have a limited number left. Um, uh, tickets are $20 for children and $35 for adults. Well, thank you for joining us for our news tonight. On behalf of the entire team, I'm Christina Dragovich. We'll see you right back here tomorrow night. Have a beautiful evening, Bahamas.